Certainly good to see you all this morning. Thankful for being out and enjoying this beautiful day together. Certainly singing songs that lift our spirits. Am I the only one that closes my eyes when we sing close my eyes? I hope not. But I can tell you that God is wise. And when He commands His people to assemble, and He commands His people to sing, He commands His people to pray, God knows His people well. And I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity, we have the privilege to come together and to do those things with friends and family and those that love the Lord. And, and I can't help but think that 100% of the time I spend here helps me be better for the other six days if the Lord chooses to give them to me that I could be this week. And I appreciate you being here today and I hope that what we have to speak about today touches your heart to a degree that it will change the way you behave. Because indeed, God's will should do just that. Remember, this is not an exercise to fill an hour. Because if that's all the case, then guess what? There's a lot of things we can choose to fill an hour. This is a very, very unique time, ladies and gentlemen. This is an opportunity to empty our hearts and empty our minds that we might readily receive what God's will has for us this morning. And I want to to talk with you about something that at one time I struggled greatly with. It sneaks up on me occasionally, but yet I think it's something that we need to be reminded about and we need to be on guard for. And I hope it is profitable to you. The picture behind you may be recognizable to you. Some of you have been there. Some of you may hope to go there. If you're afraid of heights, you may care to never go there. But it's the Grand Canyon. And, and one very frustrating thing about the canyon <clears throat> is that you could never describe it well enough unless you see it. Every picture I've ever taken of it, every time I've tried to explain it, you just you have to see it to appreciate it. But you know, there's a couple things that I think about. I think about the Grand Canyon. I think about the night sky. And I think about the ocean. And I try to think about those things regularly because it helps me appreciate my insignificance. It helps me appreciate my smallness. Maybe insignificance isn't the the right word but yet appreciate my place, we might say, in the universe. And the reason why I think it's important, especially for me in my heart, to do that is because it helps me with this. It helps me embrace humility. And it is very important for the child of God to embrace and practice humility. We're going to look at some verses this morning that encourage us to understand what humility is and why it is so valuable to God and and how it is that we might understand it. What it looks like in my life or, or more dangerously maybe why I can't find it in my life. But yet we see here in Proverbs 22 and 4, we're just joking about reading Proverbs all the time, aren't we? The reward for humility And fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. And we talked about this last week. If you remember in our Faith for Life lesson, we talked about what that life component represented. But here I want you to appreciate the reward for humility. And fear of the Lord is indeed riches and honor and life. And I believe as we begin to understand and look at what the Bible has to teach about humility, we'll begin to maybe recognize some things in our lives that we may need to improve upon. Now you see, of course, the image before you and it says, Christians, we're not perfect, we're just better than you. (laughs) So, So I say that in jest naturally because obviously I would hope that none of you feel that way. But, ladies and gentlemen, I tell my children this all the time. Stereotypes come from somewhere. 
So uh, take your attention to Luke chapter 18. If you care to open your Bibles, we're going to read this together here this morning. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9 through 14. I hope it's familiar to you, but let's read it together. Luke 18, starting in verse 9. He also told this parable to some, speaking of Jesus here, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So you see here what Jesus is wanting to teach these people because of their behavior here. They trusted in themselves and they treated others with contempt. And he says in verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So that is something indeed I want to emphasize. I want you to understand that on multiple levels in the New Testament and some in the Old as well, this universal instruction is given. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I want you to notice there who's doing the exalting in the first part of that equation. And then we're going to look at the latter part of that equation here in a little bit about those that choose to humble themselves and how they are exalted. Well, is this just jest or is this really a problem? Well, I I would contend to you that it is indeed a pretty serious problem. I'm not saying that all of us struggle with this, but I can tell you that we don't help each other very much in the plight of trying to be more humble. And there was a program out, I hadn't read it or or watched it yet, but it is kind of a focus on uh, Facebook, and it's this idea of the culture of social media and how those influences kind of get into our minds and into our hearts. Daniel uh, made a good application in class this morning Uh, about downloading, if you will, right? That information into our hearts, spoken like a true man that works with computers every day, no doubt. This idea that when we bring that information into our hearts, it's there. And it lives there until we do something with it. And unfortunately, those things guide our behaviors. They guide the things that we do and, and the way that we act, and oftentimes, unfortunately, the way we see the world. And unfortunately, our culture does an awful lot to skew this concept of humility into what some people might call false humility. This idea of wanting it to appear one way when I genuinely feel very differently about something. And we all struggle with this. It's everywhere. It's at our elbows. This is not a young person's problem. This is not an old person's problem. This is our problem. If you're in this building, the world over, this is something that plagues us. We always have someone whispering in our ear, it could be more about you. And unfortunately, we need to ask ourselves some genuine questions if we're going to work through this effectively. How do I in my life profess humility? I want you to ask yourself that question. I want you to answer that question right now. I want you to just come up with three things. Can I point to three things in my life that I try, I'm consciously aware of, to profess humility in? And I'll give you a moment. You think of three?
maybe I need to put more emphasis on humility. Because I promise you, being proud of things is practically shoved down our throat on a regular basis. How many different things can we be proud of? How many lifestyle choices that are devoid of God's will do we celebrate and we have pride in? Those are things that we have to be very, very careful of. It is not, we say often, rocket science to understand what the will of God is in terms of being proud about things or being humble. And so as we continue our self-assessment, we think about this. Am I guilty of getting sucked into this idea of the focus being on me, the limelight being on me, drawing attention to myself? How many times, even in class this morning, right, we discussed about the fact that sometimes inadvertently, right, accidentally, innocently, we might say, we're behaving in a certain way, and then all of a sudden we realize, whew, that really seems like I'm bragging that up a little bit. Maybe I ought to step back just a minute. Sometimes you don't realize how arrogant something sounds until we say it out loud. And then maybe we offer up a, a buffer or an apology for some kind of statement like that. But ask yourself, how do I feel when I'm trying to show something or be something or, or express myself and then someone steals the limelight or something shifts away or I'm not given the attention that I feel I deserve? Let me just ask that last question very carefully. How do I feel when I don't get the attention that I feel I deserve? Because if I'm honest with myself, I usually feel scorned in some way. I feel overlooked. I feel passed over. I feel undervalued. I feel insignificant, to use that word again. And you know, so many times and in so many ways, and I've said this so often, pride, or sin rather, starts by some mechanism of pride. If you remember that lesson we did on pride, I put the I in pride as big as I could on that slide. Because that's where those problems stem from. Is this idea that that pride is so infecting and affects our lives in so many negative ways. But yet I would appeal to you to look at some of the characters that we can look to in the scriptures. For examples in ways that we've seen other people be humble. In ways that we might try to emulate that. We know what the world is trying to convince us to do. We know what uh, you know Satan would love to have us grandize ourselves with and for. But there are so many people in the scriptures. And we're just going to look at three people here very briefly by an illustration of, of, of humility. Solomon, King Solomon, Old Testament. Guy's a huge character, right? I mean, no one was as wise, right? God said, there's not going to be anyone that has a parallel of your wisdom in all the earth. I mean, that's a pretty impressive character, is it not? There's someone who, if there was an opportunity to be proud, now we understand Solomon made some pretty bad decisions, so, but I want you to look at something here, and I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 3. And I want to just read a few verses here for you in 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And it's talking about the very beginning when Solomon was going to become king. In a verse in 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 7, it says, And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? That sounds like a pretty humble way to start off, doesn't it? The king, the earthly king of God's chosen people. And it says in verse 10, we continue, And it pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this. And God said to him, Because you have not, or because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself for long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, 
but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. Now that is an impressive blessing, is it not? Who is doing the lifting up here? Certainly it is God, because Solomon understood this need for humility. Now, I want you to appreciate how God closes this thought. And it says in verse 14, and he says, And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And we know so many times God gives these blessings and he pleads with us in that same breath, please do not depart from me. Because in as easy as the illustration even we used last week, I don't mean to wear it out, but the 10 lepers, right? The minute that you get something, sometimes you quickly forget the hand from whence it came. You're so quick to run off and celebrate and do things and enjoy things that you forget. Sometimes where this blessing, where this health, where this prosperity comes from. John the Baptist, you know, this guy rose to fame pretty quickly as he's preparing the way for the Lord, did he not? And, And several come to John and said, hey, there's another guy over there baptizing, you know, and everybody's going to him. And John said, didn't I tell you that he was coming? I told you plainly that I was not the Christ, but that I was sent before him. And it says in John 3 and 30 and 31, what an interesting way that he describes this or he says this. He says, John the Baptist here in the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 30, he says, He must increase and I must decrease. 31, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. What a statement. You know, we don't even really talk much about that part of John's address of Jesus. But yet look at the wisdom that John was endowed with for him to be able to make that statement. But yet in all of the popularity and all of the attention that John was getting, look at the lesson that he was able to teach with his influence. It is time for Christ indeed to increase. And it is time for me to decrease. Can you look back at a time in your life when you had the wisdom to do that? When you nurtured someone to a point where they were ready and you could continue to run out in front of them and take all the praise and take all the glory and take all the attention. But there was a time, right, that you needed to let go. There was a time you needed to let them set out on that journey, whether it's your children in life or whether it's someone at work that you've trained or a family member that you've guided. There are times that those people must then, of course, embark on their own. You know, Rick Warren is an author that got a lot of popularity for writing a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Now, I've, I've, I don't, I'm not endorsing any of that stuff. I mean, men are men, and they write good things, and sometimes they write bad things. But man, I had to read the book because when I opened it, at least the version that I read, and I know there's been several revisions, chapter one, the title of chapter one, it's not about you. I'm like, ooh, what's in here? <laughs> so, so that appealed to me because so many times we're talked about or we're encouraged to focus so much on ourself. And guys, if you're so worried and anxious about how you're going to take care of you and how you're going to get yours and what you need and the things that you have to have to survive, uh, granted, there are all necessities that we need. But you know one of the quickest ways that I stop worrying about what I need is I try to look somewhere else and see if I can do something for someone else who has a need. And you know, my need may not even get met. But you know, I worry about it a whole lot less because I'm busy thinking and doing something for someone else. Just try that. When we dizzy ourselves trying to make sure that we get ours, we may eventually get it. 
But have we spent any time serving others, putting others above ourselves? Oftentimes the answer to that is, is no. Now Christ, <clears throat> we're going to talk about his illustration, his example, but yet he's the one that provides the subject content for all that we're going to be discussing. There are so many different ways that we see the humility characteristic in Christ. I mean, my, the biggest one that I go to almost every time is washing the disciples' feet. You know, the Son of God girding his loin with a towel and then sitting down and washing the feet of the disciples, the apostles. And, and you know, of course, you remember some of them were appalled. You will never wash my feet, right, was one of the statements. And he said, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And he said, then, then wash all of me. You know, I mean, I, I can appreciate this. I would be having, that'd be the hardest time I'd ever sat in a chair in all my life is to have to sit there and watch the Son of God wash my feet. But he even said, he's like, what I do now, you don't understand. But, but you will understand. Of course, and this is part of the instruction that he gives us in Matthew 23 and 11. He tells us this simple sentence, the greatest among you shall be your servant. And I love this simple one-sentence statement because it speaks two things. It talks about those that are great, those that are greatest among you, right? Not because maybe we want to show our lack of humility, not because we want to climb to the top of the pile and leave everyone else in the dust, but I want to be the best that I can be in everything that I do. That doesn't mean that I want to be better than you. It just means I want to do everything that I can with all that God has given me. And if that means that I excel, then so be it. But it's not because I want to be better than you. I want to be as pleasing to God as I can possibly be. And so I want to be great in God's eyes. I don't want to be seen as great among you. But when God looks down, don't you want to say, yeah, Casey, he's one of mine. Isn't that what we want? That's what I want. And it says, the greatest among you shall do what? Not stand at the top of the hill and beat your chest. Not stand up there and say, hey, anybody want to help me be great? No, it says, if you want to be great, go serve. And so I have to ask myself, then what am I doing to serve? What am I doing to practice my humility? What am I doing to put others before myself? So God also gives us plenty of illustration to help us understand what a life of humility looks like. And so I want to take you back into Luke, but I want to take you to chapter 14. And I want you to, I want you to look at this parable that he gives us in Luke 14, starting in verse 7. And it says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come to you and say, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Boy, that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? This is not your seat. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. <clears throat> then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Sound familiar? Guys, I tell you, when you think about what that equation looks like. Now, I want to be careful, and I'm not going to develop this thought a lot, but I think most of you understand what I say when I say, beware of false humility. Don't go out there and just try to do something like this because you're hoping that the host will say, Jamie, what are you doing? You're my best friend. Come on up here. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at me, everybody. See, that's false humility. Be careful what our motives are, ladies and gentlemen, because only you know them. Only you and God. And look at the disservice we're doing if we think we're going to fool man because we're certainly not going to fool God. But you had to appreciate, appreciate what the illustration is here. Be grateful that you were invited. 
don't seek the high seats, right? And it says that he, he gave that parable because there were those that were seeking the preeminence among their brethren. So a good illustration for us to look and see how that might play out in our lives, in our circumstances. And I, I want you to appreciate the fact that we need humility to be pleasing to God. James 4 and 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I can't live in this life without grace. I need God's grace every day. And when I understand that God opposes the proud, that's the last thing I need in my day. I need his help every step of the way. I don't need to be living a life that I'm unnecessarily complicating for myself. I don't want to be in a place where God is going to oppose me because I desperately need him too much in my life. But I understand an easy equation. If I've got a haughty spirit, that proud look that Proverbs talks about, God opposes these things. You know, and there's, there's a beautiful verse I found in Psalms. Psalms chapter 25 and verse 9. Listen to this. I, I haven't read this in a super long time. Psalms 25 and verse 9, it says this. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. He leads the humble in what is right and he teaches the humble his way. I immediately went like mental, you know, swing back to like this dad teaching his little boy how to do something. Because it, it's almost like, you know, when we are so busy and full of ourselves, we don't have much room to be taught anything, do we? But yet when we see that tenderness that we read there in, in Psalms 25, that if we're indeed humble, God will teach us his way. He further develops this idea in 1 Peter. <clears throat> in verses 5 and 6 of 1 Peter 5, he says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Of course, then we have God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Same instruction we found in James. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. So at the proper time, he may exalt you. Do you notice that? So I want you to appreciate, I, I, I have a tremendous amount of, of love and respect for our elders. I believe their job is weighty, and it is incredibly critical. And I pray for long life and good health and good judgment for them all of their days. But you know, their job might be just a percent easier if every one of us raised our level of humility 1%, right? If we were willing that if they ever had to, God forbid, come and correct me and what I have said, what I have taught, how I am living, what I have done, the example I've set, fill in the blank. If someone is brave enough because they love you enough to come and try to talk with you about corrections you need to make, you realize how much healthful, how much, how much helpful and healthful that interchange would be if you would exercise humility in that moment if you would exercise a closed mouth and an open mind in that moment look at what humility does look at the opportunity that it presents and now remember what I told you when we're busy exalting ourselves we're told that we'll be brought low but notice here in 1 Peter, we get to find out who it is that does the exalting when those humble themselves. And it says, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time he may exalt you. You think about this for a minute. If you've got someone out there and they're bragging about how good they are, that kind of gets a little hard to hear after a real short minute, doesn't it? When someone's real busy telling you about how great they are, I mean, you, you're kind of probably glad to know, but usually the delivery's, delivery's a little rough because it seems like it's bragging and it's arrogant and it's certainly not humble. But you know what? If a friend of that person comes and just really brags that person up, isn't the exchange completely different? Because it's not the person that's building themselves up. It's someone else 
that's praising and elevating and, and, and being thankful and appreciative of this person and what they've done or the person that they are. It's an easy mechanism for us to understand. So can you even imagine exponentially more if God would be the one exalted? That's what we should be striving for. That is what I want. That is what I want for all of you. But, you know, there's a real simple illustration, we, some points that we ought not miss. When it comes to our life and the, the, the plight for our humility... We very simply need to understand God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And I need that grace, and I think you do too. And God exalts the humble. And that is something that I, I, I don't look at, I don't long for, but I can only imagine what that would look like, right? When God exalts his people, when God shines his light in the darkness, the goodness that can be seen. We're even told, right, do our good works that they might be seen of men, that they might glorify our Father which is in heaven. It goes on in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Okay, so this is some nut and bolt stuff. This is how we can run down that path of humility, or of lack of humility, rather. Because when we get selfish, when we have those ambitions that really only serve our singular goal or need, we got to be careful with those things. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Can you do that? Do you try to do that? That's an exercise that's good for us. Try to do everything you can to talk through this in your mind to build other people up to be more significant than yourself. I've often said humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. You're not always putting yourself out in the front. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he, or I'm sorry, through he, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I know no greater illustration of humility, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can appreciate the full weight of that statement. We see how much God desires humility. We see how much of a struggle we find when we are proud. And so my, my, my plea for you this morning, appreciate the humility that you see in the scriptures. Understand the power that that can create in your life. And understand that when you're willing to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will lift you up. And I can't imagine how great of a day it must have been when human eyes saw God lift his son up, both spiritually and most certainly physically. Can you even just stop for a moment and appreciate what it must have been like to stand there and watch Christ ascend into heaven? Humility, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we need to fight fiercely for we need to be so aware of it because we are told in so many different ways in so many different directions to be proud of things to celebrate so many things but yet appreciate what the scriptures said about those prideful things another verse i found in psalms so very fitting for this morning psalms 149 and verse 4 for the lord takes pleasure in his people he indeed loves them. We know that. He adorns the humble with salvation. That's what we want. That's what we want for every soul here this morning. Have you put on Christ in the watery grave of baptism? Have you risen to walk a new creature? You know what that new creature does? That new creature strives to be humble. When we think about the adornment, there are so many different things we think of to add to something, usually to make it more attractive or more uh, appealing. 
But is there anything better that you and I could ever hope for in this life than to be adorned with salvation? We would love to help you with your walk with God. This very morning, we are all here right now. Is If humility or the lack of it has been a real struggle for you, if you're not really sure how this needs to work out in your life, don't wait. Don't wait. Waiting to come to the Lord until your life is all perfect is kind of like waiting to go to the emergency room until you stop bleeding. Right? We don't do that. Right? We need to go when we need to go. And if you're living a life that serves you and you're not embracing the humble spirit that God desires, let us pray for you. Be willing to give your life to God so that he can guide you in all the ways that are pleasing to him and that do end in salvation for your soul.